Well, thank you for having me again. How many were here last time I spoke? Okay. Those that weren't. Well, to tie in kind of where I left off last time. And it's, it's a testimony of what God can do in someone's life. If you'll just surrender it and give it to him. Don't try to plan it. Um, so I find myself in Vietnam. I'm running from the Lord. He wants me to be a preacher. I don't want to be a preacher. And after being there for a while with the group that I was with, we had a lot of Green Berets that joined our group, airborne people, rangers, and it was a very volunteer group. And uh, we were used a lot by other agencies, and I liked what I was doing. And I made up my mind. I had written my mother a letter and told her, uh, that I was going to extend another year for my contract with the U.S. government, that I was going to be going to Africa as a mercenary. I enjoyed killing bad guys. And I really didn't like bad guys because I was raised where bad guys to beat me up all the time, and I just said, uh, not, not going to happen. And I wanted to be a liberator. Now, here's something that's interesting. Even as a kid, I wanted to liberate other people. God will put something in you as a child. I was raised in church, you see. But uh, then you run into these things that happen to you when you're growing up, and you carry them with you until God can deliver you from them. But nevertheless, I knew I wanted to liberate people that were oppressed, even small people, people in high school that were bullied. I go after the bullies. I love the bullies because I could bring down the bullies. I would study them. And see, because they were bigger than I, but I figure, wait, I can get him and I can bring him down. So in Vietnam, I found my, my calling for a while, and I said, I love this. And there's this guy in, in Africa called Idi Amin. I says, I want to bring him down. I want to join this group. And I qualify for it, and so forth and so on. So uh, we get in a battle situation where. Uh, the first team got knocked off. I pulled my team to the, to the left and uh, pulled up security. And uh, I'm laying prone on the jungle floor, and this boy speaks to me and says, Move back. If you don't, a bullet will hit your head and you'll die. And I shrugged it off, said, I fear no man. I will fear no combat. And in fact, I've been in worse combats than this. And so the voice came again the second time. says, Move back. If you don't. I feel someone had me zeroed in, but I couldn't find him. I had always found everybody else, but this one guy I couldn't find. Him. The voice came to me the third time and says, Boot back if you don't, a bullet will hit your head and you'll die, and I'll not tell you again. Well, I was more afraid of that voice than I was that combat. But still, I hesitated, and when I did, I knew the bullet was on its way. And I spun around and put my foot where my head was before, and a bullet hit my ankle and flipped me. I crawled back, <clears throat> fired my weapon, and uh, the medic came and badged me up. And so eventually, they, uh, after they took the other uh, team that got hit, they had airlifted them out. We were in a very thick jungle, so we had to depend on jungle penetrators coming down from the helicopter to pick us up. And so those three had gotten taken off, and that's about the time I got hit. And uh, I told the LT, I said, you call me a chopper, I'm not blind. I'm, don't try to drag me out of the jungle with this. I said, I don't, jungle infection will take my leg off. I said, I probably already lost my foot, but I don't want to lose the, the rest of it. So he said, okay, so he called in a, a dust off. And uh, they got about, I don't know, 180, 200 feet above the treetop level. And, Dropped the penetrator down. I uh, gave him my AK vest and my car 15. He gave me his 45 in case we went down. Lifted me up. I got about treetop level and I looked down and phew, there they are. Shooting at me, hitting the helicopter. Ding, ding, ding. And I said, Whoa, how are we going to get out of this one? I'm with this 45 popping out. And finally, the crew chief, I mean, the, the flight chief, just phew, put the handle forward. Drug me through the top of the trees about 20 yards and finally got airborne and got out and pulled me up in that helicopter. 
And I crawled over to that crew chief and I handed him that 45 and I said, I'm going home to preach the gospel. Well, he probably thought I was still smoking dope or something. <laughs> and uh, he was just like, what? You know, I knew what God was doing. And the, the, the whole thing of the testimony is to show that God wants to take you from here and, but he says, I got an assignment way down the road, and you've got these steps you've got to make to get there. That's right. And a lot of times you'll have a calling, and you go, There's no way I can make that calling. Just like when I was a kid, I had a, I had a calling to deliver people from bad guys. Well, that was just an inner mirror thing. God said, I put something in your heart, you don't know what to do with it. And he said, but way down the road when you get mature, that calling is going to come. For those that, that have a dream, when you're a kid or something, you're like, I can't do that. No, you couldn't do it. But let God develop that. So, uh, how should we start? This is difficult because there's so many. You know, okay, God, you're using me for the future. But first, I gotta, I gotta do the present. So I figured, well, uh, when I finally got out of the, the hospitals in Japan, they sent me to the one there in Austin, uh, San Antonio, or Brooks General, I believe. Spent a couple months there, and I figured, well, they'll, they'll give me a medical discharge. And uh, no, they didn't. They sent me to Fort Hood, better known as Fort Hill, for those that's ever been there. Very hot. It was somewhere very cold. And I said, Lord, what am I doing here? I got what, 15 more months of this. I don't want to play soldier. I've already been a soldier. Now you want me to play soldier. But the whole thing was, was to settle me down. You know, get that combat out of me. You know, settle down because I was still, you know, uh, don't get in my face. Don't mess with me. Or use that as a nice word. And uh, <laughs> God said, we got to take this out of his city. So I had to sit there for 15 months, play war games, and I beat them at war games, and uh, they didn't want to play war with me anymore because I won. <laughs> you know? And uh, so I said, okay, God, I can't wait to go to college. I'm going to go, you know, so I got my SAT and did all that. was in the military and went to Central Texas College for a while. And da, 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 da. And I said, well, I'm going to go to this uh, uh, uh Bible Seminary College, so I can get, uh, you know, learn how to be a good Christian, how to be a good preacher, and, and then, so I go there to this denominational seminary, and I'm there for a year, and I'm very perplexed. I'm going, I'm looking at this going, you know, I really don't belong here. Where do I belong? For one year I was there, going to learn how to be a a milk toast preacher, you know, the thing I didn't want to be. And uh, I just look around at the kids there and I'm going, I don't want to be this. And you have to understand, these were good Christian folks. The pastor sent their daughters there to marry good Christian guys. But I wasn't a good Christian guy. I don't want to be a good Christian guy. I want to be a follower of Jesus. You made me to be a conqueror. And I can't do this. And he spoke to me very plainly. It was one of the first times or the second time. The first one was in the jungle. The second one was very clearly, he said, well, since you've asked me what I want to do with you. And I thought, what? He says, I want you to go to the agnostic university. And there I want you to study about human beings and how stupid they are. <laughs> and I want you to learn how to deal with those type of people. He says, I've got plenty of preachers. You see them, don't you? I said, yeah. I said, I don't want any part of it, really. He said, no, because they haven't called you to do that. Now, if he's called them to do that, that's fine. But he called me still. I want to be a rebel. Well, okay, I'm going to be a rebel for Jesus. I don't have to fit this mold. You know what I'm talking about. I don't want to be this. I want to be, I want to be me. I want to be me. 
and say, Lord, how can I be me and still be a Christian? He says, if you want to be, we'll, do, we'll work it out. So you got to understand, I loved what I was doing in the novel, and I loved what the future I was going to have as a mercenary, delivering people, loving the adventure of thrill, of facing death, and who's going to win. That was the whole thing. So we're going to make it a little short. I'm in Africa. In fact, I was wearing this, the same, uh, uh, what do you call it, a journey or a safari, safari thank you, safari jacket. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, we've got over, as you know, over 200, probably 230 churches in Africa now, Bible schools and all this. So instead of being a mercenary in Africa, I became a missionary in Africa, but doing the same thing, delivering people. This time it's delivering from the evil one himself. So anytime I'm there, I like to take one day off and just kind of enjoy myself, you know, go to a, a park or something like that. And I went to this one place right out of Nairobi, and uh, I, I liked, uh, I liked the monkeys. And I like the big ones, I like the small ones, I like the apes, you know. And uh, I found this one character sitting on a termite mound. Sitting there like a big, about that tall. He had those big three inch fangs. He was sitting up there looking around and had all of his ladies out there, you know. He was he was the king beast. And I enjoyed watching him. I wanted to study, I wanted to get closer to him. It was a baboon. So I got walking towards him, and he looked at me, and he walked around, and he came to this little place in the, in the jungle where there was two paths. And in between the paths, like a medium of a small brush jungle situation. And, uh, so I said, I want to get a picture of him face to face, so I had to come around my neck. So he went to the right of that trail. I, went, I took the left one. I said, I'll catch him at the end of that trail. Being known to me, he got there before I did, and he turned around, and there he was, facing uh, from here to that door, possibly closer. And uh, I looked at him, and he looked at me, and I went, uh-oh. Uh-oh. I think I just stepped over too far. I, I think, Lord, you, th you think I just went too far here? And he's looking at me, I'm looking at him, and they love to go for the face. He had the camera here. So I knew about them that they, when they do charge, they're going to come for your face. You can't outrun them. I'm looking at him. He's looking at me, and I said, I'll just slightly pull back. So I took my right foot, and I slid back about this far. And he goes, and he looks at me, and he grins. I see those canines, and I knew he was coming after me because I showed fear. Now you say, what, what does this tie into? I'll show you in a minute. And so when I moved my foot back, he learned, he learned, a split second thing. He started to lunge when he did. I lunged towards him with this foot and clapped my hands and spoke to what he I said, upon, upon a one of I said, no, no, Lord. No, no, boss. As if he spoke for you. <laughs> well, he stopped. I stopped. We're looking at each other. And we're going, I can't show fear. He can't show any fear because he's a baboon, you know. And so we walk off parallel to each other until we just kind of spread apart. Now, you think I'd have enough wisdom not to come back the next day. The next day I came back and I got me a bamboo stick. I hid it behind me. Come to the same place and he's on that same mound. He sees me. I got you, white boy. So he just goes on down. Get that trail. He goes to the right. I go to the left. He meets at the bend of the trail and he showed me his canines and I showed him my bamboo stick. And I popped it in front of him and said, You'll not make a monkey. And I chased him off of there and I popped him here and there. And what I learned from that at the 
very beginning that even with Satan, you can't show fear because that's how he destroys God's people. Even the Bible says, uh, my people are destroyed for lack of what? Knowledge. Knowledge of what? Knowledge of God. And 365 plus indications in the Bible, fear not. Fear is what, fear is what, you, you learn this in the jungle, if you're going to hit the enemy and you turn your back to him, you're gone. They're going to come and overrun you. So if you learned anything about uh, the jungle warfare, it's the same warfare in the gospel. You can't turn your back to the enemy. Right now we're going, oh, we saw about you. Oh, look at the Wokies. They come and poke us. They poke us, us the Wokies. Oh, no. Oh, let's run from the Wokies. Look what they're doing to our country. Oh, I don't want any parts of it. No. You attack. When Jesus went to the cross, it wasn't defenses, it was attack. He finally destroyed the enemy for our sake. Luke 10 19 says, Behold, I give you power and authority over all the power of the enemy. Nothing. Even baboons. Nothing. Well, you say, well, that was for the seven day. And I said, well, let's go to Acts 2 and 4. He said, I'm going to give you another comforter. And you're going to cast out devils in my name. <clears throat> well, you can't cast out devils running. You have to attack it. Right on. I was in the Philippines. I'm just showing you what God can do with a life that is dedicated. Use it. You know, I love action. He says, I have plenty of action. Come on. So I'm in the Philippines. I'm ministering in Bill Bed Prison, which is the last uh, vestige, if you please, on the island of Luzon in the Philippines, the very top. In the jungle. Old fort that was built back in the 1890s from the Spaniards. It was a prison. And I'm there uh, ministering. We brought some ladies from the church to sing. 